All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Shelby Ward. I'm the Director of Sustainable Tennessee with the Tennessee Environmental Council. The council works so nature and human beings can both live harmoniously and thrive in the natural environment of Tennessee. And we are so excited today to have you with us for our very first virtual policy and practice meeting. Um, we're calling it Community Driven Policy and Practice, a conversation or workshop about environmental equity. And we have um, some great speakers today uh, to share with you all. And I'm here to share a few housekeeping things before we get started. Um, so first, um, we have a Facebook audience and a Zoom audience. And so for our Facebook audience, um, please say hello in the chat. Um, it's being moderated by our communications director, Brandy Pruitt. Give us a thumbs up. Let us know how you're feeling about what's going on. We also have the Zoom room, of course. Um, and so in the Zoom room, we have a chat. Please say hello. Uh, let us know that you're here. That will be open for folks to interact. And we also have some polls. And I'm going to turn on the first poll and um, I'm launching it now. Uh, and it'll be on during my intro moment. So just let us know where you're tuning in from. Are you coming from West Tennessee, Middle Tennessee, East Tennessee, or beyond Tennessee? Um, because we're, this is open to everyone. And um, next, um, I wanted to say we'll have some other questions that we'll be asking the audience and I'll share the results for this one, but some of the other questions will be anonymous. So feel free to um, respond and the, the panelists and the, our, our team can take a look at those later. Um, and so with that, there was a team of folks that made this possible. Uh, so I mentioned Brandy, our communications director. Um, we also have with us in the Zoom room, um, Emily Aragoyan, who is our um, environmental outreach uh, coordinator. So thank you, Emily, for all of your work. Um, and then of course, our fearless leader, the CEO of the Tennessee Environmental Council, Jeff Berry. Thank you so much, Jeff, for all of your work. And we have a very, very special guest in the room, uh, Kathy Friskus Warren, who has graciously donated her time and expertise to be our moderator. She is with the Maddox Fund. Um, and so she will reintroduce everyone uh, to the panelists. So for those that registered uh, via Zoom, you got the detailed bios in your inbox. Um, but Kathy will give a refresher uh, before she starts the moderated panel. Um, so I'm trying to think any other housekeeping on my end. Um, well, let's take a look at the poll results. So I will end the poll. And um, I'm trying to think, can people, oh, let me share the results. I have to, so people can see. Um, so we have folks from all across Tennessee, great, and beyond Tennessee. Um, so that's what we uh, love to see here because um, the conversations that we'll be having, um, our, our panelists have experiences within the state of Tennessee, but there are also things that apply more broadly. Um, so with that, I will also say the recording of this will be available on Facebook because we're streaming it live on Facebook and it will also be available on our YouTube. So you can check it out in either place for later. So with that, I'll hand it over to Emily, who has a few slides of introductory material that are key for understanding environmental equity related concepts. So Emily, uh, please take the mic. Hello everyone, I'm gonna share my screen just so we can look at the slides together. Okay, I hope everyone can see that well. Okay. Community-driven policy and practice, a conversation about environmental equity. Now, our why. We recognize that environmental justice and racial justice are one and the same. In order to attain environmental justice for all communities, we must address the systems that were designed to be exclusionary from their inception. To that end, we are making an active commitment towards these ideals. This conversation today is only an early step in the necessary dialogue for change within the mainstream environmental movement. We will continue to reflect, grow, and teach others about the importance of diversity, both in the environment and in our communities. We hope this seminar, along with our future breakout session, will persuade others to do the same. Now, these are some touchstones and some guiding principles that we want to guide this conversation. Discussions about identity, racism, discrimination are difficult, but we should each challenge ourselves to grow. Comfort is not required. Courageous conversations are valued. Understand that people have different backgrounds and perspectives, and you or someone else may say the wrong thing. In those instances, it is important for everyone to have grace and humility. In order to be impactful, you need to continue to have these conversations with both people within and outside of your community. Now, these are some key words that the panelists may bring up. Environmental racism is the disproportionate impact of environmental hazards on people of color, BIPOC. 
Black, Indigenous, people of color, an acronym that includes all people who do not identify as white. Marginalized population, groups and communities that experience discrimination and exclusion because of unequal power relationships across economic, political, social, and cultural dimensions. Poverty, the state or condition in which a person or community lacks the financial resources and essentials for a minimum standard of living. Poverty means that the income level from employment is so low that basic human needs can't be met. Poverty stricken people and families might go without proper housing, clean water, healthy food, and medical attention. Environmental justice, the process of reaching fair treatment of people of all races, cultures, incomes, and educational levels with respect to the development and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policy. And just a note on this, environmental justice is the process and environmental equity would be the desired outcome. Furthermore, environmental justice doesn't always have to be environmental laws, regulations, and policies. It could be changes within society about perspectives and thoughts. Now, a poll should show up on your screen. And so the poll question is, how would you rate your level of understanding concerning environmental justice? And I'll leave it open for 10 more seconds. And the poll is going to close right now. Okay, now I wanna talk about how to submit questions. If questions arise during the panelist discussion, please submit the question through the Q&A feature located at the bottom right of your screen. I have an image below to help display it. The chat feature will not be used for taking questions, only the Q&A. Feel free to discuss um, certain concept, maybe link some resources below in the chat, however. And off to our moderator. Great, thanks Emily and Shelby. Y'all um, have made this really fun to work on and I know that our panelists will bring us a lot of great information. Um, you, you're seeing some of the, um, there are pictures and titles. I'll just go over that, but also many of you have received their bios through um, email and you can see just how accomplished the panel is. Um, our first person is Erica Davis. Erica is the chair of the board of SACOM. Um, SACOM has been an, involved in environmental justice for a long time, so I look forward to hearing about the work of SACOM. Um, Stan J Johnson is the executive director of SEED, which stands for Socially Equal Energy Efficient Development out of Knoxville. And it was really fun looking at his website, so I'm looking forward to hearing about the work of SEED. Um, Dr. Lisa Reyes Mason is an associate professor at the University of Denver Graduate School of Social Work. Um, and she most, she recently moved to Denver, but um, before was at UT Knoxville. So we'll, we'll have both the Tennessee perspective, but also so, probably some rich ideas that she's picking up having moved to a new location. And then finally, Dr. Dietra Young, who's the Associate Professor of the Department of Agriculture and Ec Environmental Sciences at TSU. She's also the Associate Dean of Academics and the Land Grant Programs um, Manager in the Department of Agriculture. So welcome to all of our panelists, um, and we look forward to learning from you. Um, so we're gonna have just an opening question I'm gonna pose to each of the panelists so we can kind of get in the room together and begin to understand your work, but also begin to understand issues of environmental equity and environmental justice a little bit better. Um, and so Erica, I think we'll start with you and I'm gonna ask you each this question. Um, kind of in a nutshell, help us understand the work that you do. Um, but then if you could, from your experiences, if you could kind of zero in and give us some really examples of uh, environmental racism or environmental injustice and how do we look at environmental equity um, in a new way some of us may not know how to look at it and see it so I'm wondering if y'all can provide some examples so Erica we'll start with you 
Okay, thank you everyone for uh, joining this panel and um, thank you so much Tennessee Environmental Council for um, inviting me to participate. Um, so I'm here as a representative of uh, statewide organizing for community empowerment. Um, it's a statewide organization that has been we started as a, a group called Save Our Cumberland Mountains um, and then changed our name uh, back in 2008 to reflect the evolving priorities and dynamic experiences of our membership um, and, and to um, make room for a more environmental um, and social justice centered approach to um, issues that we're facing in our communities. Um, so SOCOM is a member driven organization. Um, so the, the members are really the center of what we do, um, a very grassroots approach to um, to the concerns that we're seeing in our in our homes and in our neighborhoods. Um, and SOCOM is really about tackling, um, you know, tackling environmental, social, economic issues, and uh, where those issues intersect. Um, so that's, that's briefly what SOCOM, <laughs> SOCOM is and what SOCOM does. Um, and I just recently um, was elected as the youngest president of the board um, ever and am incredibly honored for that opportunity. And um, especially in this moment in time where youth leadership is so critical um, as we're all learning uh, together and um, dealing with, um, I mean, issues in society that are just, uh, I mean, the time is now to um, tackle them head on and to really work together to gain um, a deep understanding of what the issues are and the solutions that we can best use to address those. Um, some of the issues that SOCOM has worked on over the years, they're, they're numerous, um, but um, you know, starting in um, lower income coal field communities in um, Northeast Tennessee and Claiborne and Campbell, um, Morgan, Scott counties, um, you know, we've seen injustice after injustice uh, that is, you know, wreaked on these communities, uh, the legacy of mountaintop removal coal mining, um, the continued destruction of lands and homes and um, sources for economic prosperity um, for people. Um, so that's a big issue in Sockham's history and continues to be something that unfortunately we're still having to fight. Um, but some more recent issues, um, Sockham has been doing a lot of work um, to address housing inequality, um, to address the uh, gruesome history of redlining, um, a practice through which banks um, discriminate, discrim <laughs> what's the adverb, um, are discriminatory in the, the loans that they authorize for um, home ownership in communities and results in, in segregated neighborhoods and um, results in um, wealth inequality. So, you know, white families are able to choose where they want to live and are able to um, start building equity and that gets passed down through generations and um, can choose to live, you know, where there's not a, a factory um, that's polluting the air that they're breathing. And, and um, it's a long legacy to address um, and Sockham has, has been um, working with its members um, who are very passionate about that cause. Um, trying to stop landfills, uh, trying to encourage uh, home weatherization for lower income residents so their utilities are, are more efficient and, and their homes are healthier. Um, I could go on and on, but um, I won't. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing from uh, the other panelists and continuing in this discussion today. Great, well, thank you, Erica. It's really interesting for being able to connect things like um, economic opportunity, home ownership, and environmental racism, environmental equity. These things are interconnected. Um, also, I think you just set up um, our next speaker, which is Stan, because you talked about how important youth are to um, 
to environmental movements and to also just inclusion. So um, that's actually going to be my second question for Stan. Stan, the first question is, um, tell us a little bit about the work of SEED and then if you could give us some really concrete examples of your experience with environmental um, equity or inequity, environmental racism. Um, we look forward to hearing from you, Stan. Awesome. Uh, yeah, like I last week, I got a lot. It's, it's just a lot of work. Um, so I'll just tell you a little bit about how we started about 12 years ago. Uh, young, three young men and myself decided, you know, what could be and what should be. Like what's going on in our own community? What does this actually mean to us? And one of the things that we did not know is language, right? So when you start thinking about uh, ozone layers and polar bears and climate change and global warming and all that kind of stuff, you kind of leave out Pookie and Ray Ray and, and Mike Mike them, right? So how do we get those people involved in a, in a process of what we would call environmental justice or environmental um, equity? Because how do they even see themselves fitting in? Right. Every most of these conversations we talk about, we're we're really high level. We never really re bring it all the way down to where a, you know, a person from the holler or the hood could even understand the conversation that we're having. You go to a, a utility board meeting or a TVA meeting or heck a city council meeting, and the verbiage that they're using is so, you know, so far out there that you it's hard to get those young people involved. So how we do it is just actually get them involved. You know, we start from the basic level. Uh, we, we start talking about how does this impact you as far as socially? So then we start out with socially equal, right? Then we start talking about environmental, um, just the aspect of how, how, how do you now turn that into a financial aspect for yourself? What part of this turns into a job where you can actually do those weatherization jobs that we just talked about? Um, those solar jobs, those community, um, recycling programs, the community, uh, we, call, we have an edible forest here, you know, so we have a, a food desert in, this, in our community. So we wanna make sure that young people actually are involved in making that difference. So these young people actually planted those trees, they harvest the fruit, they actually give out the fruit in the community. So those are some of the examples that we actually do because what we talk about here is nothing really stops a bullet like a job. So being socially equal, energy efficient, now we got to develop ourselves, right? What part of this development do we need? Because when we think about poverty in our country, we talk about either, oh, look at the poor person, let's give them food, health care, uh, you know, of housing, assistance here, assistance there. Or the other side looks at it as, now Papa them did it by their bootstraps, so don't give them nothing. <laughs> Let them pull themselves up by their bootstraps. But both sides will usually agree that education is the way to bridge that gap, to move out of that poverty into uh, middle class. So we talk about how do we build our way out of poverty? You know, uh, we call it a pathway. And the way we do that is by like engaging the community in positive development. We wanna make sure that these things are actually happening, not just talking about. So when we talk about co uh, career readiness training, we actually have an eight week training class that we talk about life skills, job skills, and placement skills. You know, how do you actually get a job that turns into a career? Not four years of theory, not five years, it's eight weeks of, look, you got to show your butt up to work on time every day. <laughs> now people don't let you just let your, your tire go flat, your mama said something, the cow jumped over the moon, you're fired. You know, we got to get real to the point where, why are we going to school anyway? You know, and if, if it's to get a job or to get a career, as early as possible, we need to start talking about, you know, money equity, uh, equality, you know, inclusion, those type of things. And how do you get involved in that? Like, do you sit on a board? You know, how do you actually go, go learn about some of these things? A lot of these young people, we have the University of Tennessee in our backyard. It, I love it. It's, it's three miles away from the hood. But guess how many of our hood kids get to go to UT? You know, so that's the kind of stuff that we really want to make sure of. So we want to talk about our environmental education in more ways than just uh, the ozone layer. But these are things that are happening to you right now inside of your own community, inside of your home. So how do we make sure that your homes are healthy? So we have community engagement. So we take the same young people that people were talking about that couldn't make it or whatever, 
through that eight week training program, I was on the other end, either into training them on healthy homes and how to actually do weatherization, air leakage, duct leakage, things of that nature. Or how do we take them and use those same people as community agents, go out in the community, knocking on doors, talking to people about how their environment could be healthy so we can make sure that we have a healthy and sustainable community that we all can thrive in. So. Great, thanks, Dan. It, again, you're kind of fleshing out how um, environmental justice and environmental injustice touches so many different aspects of our lives from the ability to um, have food and, and healthy food and also the ability to have homes that are energy efficient. So thank you for kind of keep continuing to broaden that, that definition. Um, Dr. Um, Reyes Mason, I think we'll turn to you. And um, again, we're just like to hear a little bit about your work as well as um, um, kind of some concrete examples of what you, what you think of when you think of environmental racism or environmental injustice. Sure, thanks, Keki. Um, first, I'm really happy to be back with my Tennessee family and Tennessee community, uh, even though I have headed over to the Rocky Mountain West just about six weeks ago. We landed here in Denver. Um, but as Keki said, I was, um, I'm a social work professor and I was at the University of Tennessee Knoxville for the last seven years until moving over to DU. And my research and teaching um, all focus on climate change and other environmental issues as social justice issues. And so I focus in my work on bringing attention to the disparities, the injustice, the unequal impacts of climate change on people and how people who have um, historically contributed the least to causing this problem of climate change are the ones who are um, the most vulnerable, being the hurt most by climate change um, and have the least, often have the least you know, resources, we've hit on some of them already in the discussion, financial resources, for example, social capital as a resource in order to, back, to bounce back when, when things happen. Um, so in my work um, as an academic, as a professor, I also really um, pursue a lot of partnership in my work. So when I was in Tennessee, um, I was partnering with SEED, partnering with STAN, um, partnering with neighborhood associations in Knoxville. We had another project partnering with the National Weather Service offices in Tennessee, in Morristown, Nashville, and Memphis. And then so through this partnered work, I try to understand and get the word out about different kinds of weather extremes that are connected to climate change increasingly, even if we don't always talk about them. And Stan brought up the point about language. Even if we don't talk about a heat wave as being connected to climate change, that heat wave is still happening and people are still experiencing impacts of it. So studying things like severe storms, urban heat, um, flooding, how to stay safe and how to prepare and get more access to resources um, more equitably. Um, so that's what my work is about. Uh, and when I think about an, a concrete example of uh, environmental injustice, I think about um, one of the first projects I worked on when I, I first started at Tennessee was uh, a partner project with engineering and geography, a climatologist to, to do a study of uh, the urban heat island in Knoxville and see what we might find in terms of were there differences in temperature um, between neighborhoods in Knoxville based on different patterns of tree cover and um, buildings and, and development and urbanization. And part of that involved putting out these local weather stations that we created in neighborhoods. But part of it was also, which is the, the latter part is what I worked on um, or led up was the, the part of, of knocking on doors and, and talking with people, with residents, doing interviews, hearing their experiences, their perspectives. And one thing that was quickly apparent um, was the problem of high utility bills in summer during heat waves as an example of environmental injustice and how there's so many so many families in some communities who are having to make choices between turning on their air conditioner and therefore having a significantly higher KUB bill in Knoxville anyway KUB um, versus not having enough money to pay rent um, and possibly get evicted um, or put food on the table and a lot of people knew about weatherization like Stan mentioned a lot of people knew that weatherization was an option um, and in our work, what we found kind of fell on classical um, unjust lines of environmental injustice and environmental racism, where in the predominantly white and wealthier neighborhood where we did some of the work, 
most people's homes who we talked to were already weatherized. Um, and then in the primarily black and middle income neighborhood, uh, most homeowners there, or many, wanted to weatherize their homes, but felt they didn't have access to the programs or didn't know about the programs, or felt that, that it wasn't, they couldn't afford it with, with their other budgetary concerns. And then in two lower income neighborhoods, um, where we did the work, people were, were more likely to be renters. And so they were at the mercy of their landlords or the public housing um, administrators to invest in weatherization or not. Um, and so, so people, you could quickly see how for some people, um, you know, a heat wave, which is connected to climate change, uh, uh, could lead to some people just pushing a few buttons on their thermometer without giving it a second thought. And then for other people, it's, it's more of, wow, I, I don't think I can do that. Um, I'm just going to take a chance. And that might mean more illness, more mental health issues, more stress, a trip to the ER, less food on the table, all sorts of other, other issues. And so it's an example of how um, heat, climate, energy, finances, race, class, all of those intersect to produce um, this particular environmental injustice related to the question of who can keep cool during a heat wave in the summer. So. Uh, that's a great example. Thank you, Lisa. And I think, again, you've kind of kept expanding from um, frequently we, think, um, we start with rural communities that are, that are impacted, but you've brought it into the urban and also connected that housing, which both Sockham and SEED work on, is related to um, climate change and um, environmental injustice. So um, we'll move to our final panelist, um, Dr. Young from TSU. And so help us understand in a nutshell your work, um, Dietra, and also some concrete examples of environmental racism or environmental injustice. Okay. Well, good morning. Um, I'm Dietra Young from TSU. And first I would like to uh, thank everyone for this opportunity. Um, in a nutshell, what I do at TSU is I conduct research, um, I teach, and I serve as a, an administrator. Um, but most importantly, and I think that ties into what today's topic is, I have been actively seeking opportunities to broaden the minority participation in the earth and environmental sciences. And the reason that I say this is that we can have all these programs and activities and nonprofit organizations, but I think we have to broaden that participa participation. And I say this as, as a Black woman in forestry. I can go back um, to almost 20 years ago when I did my first internship with the U.S. Forest Service in John Day, Oregon, and how I was the Black gal from the Forest Service. Um, when I did my first fire and got my red card, I was the only black person at part of that fire crew. Um, so at TSU, what I've done and what I've been seeking is trying to find opportunities um, that we engage youth and our current students to address these environmental issues, um, disparities, and, 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 and look at environmental justice through that lens. Uh, one particular project that I have um, most recently I started was the Environmental Justice Academy. So it not only for TSU students, but it's for other students that attend land-grant institutions. And these students are taken through this academy of, and we provide them with the tools and the skills and the knowledge that they need that they can become champions in their own respective communities. What we do in this academy is each student um, have their own capstone project and we work on an environmental justice related issue within their respective community. Um, and then what we do is we, we provide them with some seed money and opportunities to really address out that, op, that, that issue in the community. And then we give them the opportunity to come back and present that, what they've done. Uh, most re recently, I've partnered with Urban Green Lab and um, we're partnering together to launch the Nashville Environmental Justice Initiative. Um, so this is, we're gonna have some graduate students. Um, they're here today. Um, are going to take the lead on that and really do a needs assessment to see what is needed here in Nashville um, to address um, environmental justice. Um, I will say that um, I have a partnership with Vanderbilt called Earth Horizons. And through that, we are really looking at, you know, what are these barriers? Um, and I'll give you an example. 
Um, up until last year at TSU and the College of Ag, we did not have a field course for our students. And so Vanderbilt Earth and Environmental Sciences did. Um, we're a couple of miles apart, right? They have resources and experiences that we didn't have. So we established this coll collaborative partnership to address issues to better equip our students. And when I say this, these were kids who were African-American, had never been hiking before. And what we did was we took them across the entire state for three weeks, and they really got an opportunity to explore um, the, the environment, looking at forestry and natural resources and, and, and geography. Um, so with that being said, when I can talk about tree equity and urban forest, and we all know that trees are vital and um, to our health and wealth, but we can also look at that trees are, are typically sparse in low income areas, right? And how do we address these equity issues in urban forestry? Uh, there are so many issues that we can address, but I think for me, in my role is preparing and educating, especially college students, um, to be able to handle and address these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Young. Yeah, I think that um, many, many people probably don't think about trees as being an environmental justice issue. So um, it, it, again, it's, it's a large um, concept for us to get our minds wrapped around and it's so pervasive in all aspects of our lives. And um, I'm gonna ask each of you a, a little bit of a different question. I'm gonna stay with you, Dr. Young, for right now. Um, you know, a lot of the people that are tuning into this um, panel um, are working in different areas. They may be working in water, or they may be working in land conservation. Um, some may be working with Tennessee Environmental Council on, um, on trees. Um, so I'm wondering if you could help us. They're gonna, be, they're gonna be in different areas that they're concentrating, but they're probably environmental justice and ger environmental equity issues that are operative in the work they're already doing but they don't necessarily know what questions to ask so that they can name it. And naming it is one of the things that it's needed in order for us to be able to address it. So I wonder if you could say, um, what questions do you think environmental organizations should be asking so that they can actually identify and understand the racial justice um, and environmental justice issues at work at, um, and the work they're already doing? Oh, wow, that's a good question, <laughs> kind of loaded. Um, I, in, in my opinion, um, the first thing is, is actually just doing a needs assessment. Um, and, and if I can bring up an example, um, Root Nashville, right? Meg is doing a wonderful job uh, with that program. And, you know, they have this goal to plant, uh, I don't want to say the wrong number, but they want to plant so many thousand trees in Nashville by 2050, right? Uh, I'm using them as an example. So with, with Meg and, and, and Root Nashville, the first question they had to ask is, where do we want to plant these trees and why, right? Not just we're going to plant trees in Nashville, but we need to figure out where we want to, where we want to plant these trees. And so they use GIS and they use the data and they use you know, health data to determine that there are certain pockets of Nashville has a low tree canopy cover, but they also look at the economics. They looked at, you know, this area is particularly low income. They may have looked at childhood asthma rates. Um, so there's different factors that you can look through a lens um, to determine, you know, where should we focus this work? So I think that is important. Another question is, is you got to look at, and I think this comes from leadership at the top, who do you have on your team, right? Um, your team members, I think, play a role in, in helping you determining and looking at that, that, that environmental justice lens. Um, <clears throat> more than often, what I've seen is, and I've looked at the board makeup, I'm constantly looking, um, it seems to be the same people of color on every board. You know, it's, it's like, uh, you, know, they're the, you know, they are the only ones that, that can have that, that idea, I think, diversifying the board, um, your board of directors. Um, diversifying the people on your staff to give a different, you know, thought. But I think questions you can ask is definitely doing that needs assessment and looking at the science and, and looking at the data that's being provided. Hopefully I answered your question, um, but that's what I'm thinking. Those are great. Those are great responses. You actually set up our next um, stand um, when you talked about needs assessments because Stan's work is very place-based. It's very embedded in the community. And um, so I'm wondering, Stan, if you can help us understand 
how do you find define community and why is community and a place so important to understanding environmental justice? And you're gonna to have to take yourself off mute, Stan. There you go. Does that work? All right. Uh, so co community is like your, your little family, right? Like you got this national community, <laughs> you got a state community, you got a city community, you even have these little townships. Um, I was born in Black River, Jamaica. Uh, we don't really, shouldn't say it like this, but our government doesn't function as well as your government. <laughs> as our government in this country. Um, so when, when, a, when a hurricane comes through, like we're looking at, to, you know, two of them in the Gulf, and hopefully uh, not going to be too, too bad, but they're going to go through the Caribbean Sea first. And uh, the government isn't going to send FEMA. We're going to have to go help Miss Judy across the street fix her, her roof when it, comes, when it comes down to it. So that's where my community comes from is who... Can you touch the fastest and the quickest with your ability to do whatever you're organizing around, right? And if you're organizing around your community to saying, you know, Black Lives Matter, uh, women's health, pets, you know, school children, whatever those things are, those to me are, are your community. And the, and the biggest thing that we, we have to do is just connect your dots, right? You know, you got schools, you got churches, you got business, you got all that kind of stuff. You got government. Like we rarely work together. It's like we're almost working apart separately, right? So when it comes down to let's use redlining, that was a just straight community disruption. So how do we actually do something about that kind of stuff? To me, it's, it's building other policies back inside of your community. And some of those things are, we just won't accept that, right? And, and we've done it before in this country. So those are the kind of things that we, we're gonna have to really start looking at as far as, you know, whether we're calling the climate change, global warming, the aspect is people are dying out here because we have a lack of education, lack of economic opportunities, and lack of really just resources and just the networking. I mean, look at, look at what the good doctor just said about her networking with Vanderbilt. Like, UT, Lisa and I worked together. Like we had to be able to pull that together and it was done out of a whole nother thing that we met at. So we have to be intentional to really start talking about what community is to each of us and defining it in a way of, these are the things that we will not tolerate. Um, and you know, like, like John, John Lewis said, we, we, when we see something, we gotta say something. We have to do something. And that's really been my biggest thing is we, we get caught up in what, uh, how does it benefit me, right? Instead of how does it benefit we? And when we start talking about a we, that's where we start talking about community. And that's my, pretty much my answer there. I hope I answered your question. Right. Yeah, I, I think, you know, everything starts with community. It starts with that group of people that educate themselves and then say, what, what is it that we need to change? Um, so that our lives are better and our lives can thrive. So you're starting with that place space. You have something else to add? Yeah, I got one more thing. And, and then the, the aspect of, of voting locally, right? So inside of your community, we, we get roused up about the national stuff that's happening. He said this, we said that, we got a woman on the ballot. Ah, yeah, it's gonna be great. We're gonna go at it, fist and, fist and cuff, no holes barred. But we don't even know who our city council people are. I mean, <laughs> that, that, we don't even know who our mayor is. What does, what does our mayor do? How, who's our state representative? Those kind of local things where the climate, you know, where the, these, these people are making the environmental, uh, you know, statements. They're, they're making law. They're making policy. And if we don't know who those people are, by the time it gets all the way up to the top, you know, we're, we're, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. Right. Well, and, and, um, you know, you started with community, but you very quickly brought it to the kind of the larger issue of policy and um, and 
and, and voting. So I'm going to actually kick it over to Erica because that's kind of um, your area, Erica. And that, talk about why is community organizing important when you're thinking about an environmental justice? That is a great question. Um, and I'm fired up thinking about it uh, after listening to Stan talk. Um, but so organizing, um, at, at least the way that uh, Sockham uses it um, is a tool to uh, one establish uh, those relationships that are community based um, and also to harness the resources that are necessary to make um, the, the needed changes in our communities and and organizing uh, it it is effective across all levels so when you're you know talking about organizing um, for change at the city level, at the state level. Um, it can be one agency. It can be organizing around one uh, TVA decision. Um, and, and Sockham's whole model is an organizing-based one. And our goal is to build those relationships with Sockham members and with uh, the neighbors of Sockham members and uh, to spread information and equip people with the tools and resources that they um, are that they need. Not that not that you know Sockham as an organization believes that people need, but what people are calling for uh, to make a positive difference when it comes to the issues affecting them. Uh, it's it's so different from a top down approach in which issues are identified and targeted and then you know, an organization's leaders uh, may develop a plan to um, to tackle the issue and uh, community support in in that way of going about things just may not be garnered uh, like it is when you're organizing and on the ground uh, with affected frontline communities. Um, so it really is about that grassroots action and it's it's so necessary uh, because at the end of the day to um, you know truly liberate our communities and to protect the the health of our families uh, and our neighbors we need more than information and we need more than good intentions from uh, well-meaning uh, leaders um, it, it's it's about tangible action uh, by the people and for the people um, and then when we talk about racism and specifically environmental racism, um, our organizers can use those relationships uh, that are formed, for instance, in cash poor, predominantly white coal field communities uh, to, to then have these hard conversations that Emily mentioned in, in her intro. Um, the, those really hard uh, conversations about race and racism and then you know, bring to light uh, the, the threads that tie everyone's struggles together. Uh, and, and then from there, we can encourage broader coalitions to tackle injustice across the board. Great, it's interesting to me that we're, we're, we started talking about connection to um, food and connection to water, and we've moved into needing to understand communities and needing to organize in order to make change. And so I think that kind of um, is perfect for our um, professor of social work um, to be able to ask Lisa, just how do you see um, communities and cities being able to improve their, their um, understanding of what it means to live in community and, um, and the fight for um, environmental justice? Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the first thing that comes to mind um, is for cities and uh, so city, you know, officials, agency officials um, to, to value people's everyday residents' perspectives and experiences and to go seek those out um, to get localized data. Um, aggregate data on these issues that we're talking about, if it's aggregate economic data or environmental data or health data, when those are aggregated at a city or county level, or even a census tract sometimes, that's too high of a level. It doesn't really paint the picture for you of what's really happening on the ground and the disparities that are, that are, that are 
that are finer than that. Um, and so there's a real need, I think, to, um, to get, and also, I guess by data, I don't, I don't, part of that is the survey data, the quantitative data, and part of it also is the, what the academics call the qualitative data, the taking the time, knocking on the doors, listening to people's stories, um, seeking out more um, meaningful spaces, like more meaningful participation, ways for people to participate in, in dialogue with city officials. I've, I've you know, uh, not sure if any of them are on this call, but, uh, but I have, you know, worked with folks and, and done interviews as other parts of projects where, where sometimes it, it, participation of the public means you, you check the box by offering one meeting at like five o'clock at one location in town, and then you say that you did engagement of the public. And so, um, so don't just check the box to say you held a meeting. Really look for partnerships, um, diversify where you're thinking about, connect to how you're gonna connect and learn people's stories um, and their experiences. I'll give an example, one quick example from far away and then one from closer to home maybe to make some of this more concrete. From far away, years ago, I, I, so I'm half Filipina and I did my dissertation research um, back home in the Philippines studying water insecurity at, among households. So people's everyday experiences of water insecurity. When I first started looking into this up in a very urban city up in the Northern Philippines called Baguio, um, the count, you know, the kind of aggregate statistics are water looks pretty, water access looks pretty good. And when you talk to um, the, the water utility, oh, about 80% of people have access to our water. Well, when you just start actually on the ground in neighborhoods talking to people, you were lucky if like maybe 50% actually had access to the water district's water being piped into their home. And even then it was only three days a week, four hours a day. People were borrowing water from their neighbors, paying their neighbors for water. So again, those aggregate statistics, they're not painting the picture. And to get the picture of what's on the ground, you have to put in the time and the energy and the partnership. Um, and then I'll give quick, maybe if I can, just some examples from work we did in Knoxville. So when we did try to you know, understand the experiences of um, extreme heat, for example, in Knoxville, we did a study specifically in lower and moderate income um, areas of Knoxville. And we asked people, we didn't talk about climate change per se, we talked about heat. And, um, and summer heat waves. And, and we found that in, of the 400 households we surveyed, about three quarters reported some kind of impact to their physical health. About 57% reported a mental health impact. And then two thirds reported some kind of financial impact. Um, so these are much higher statistics, I think, than if you were to, to you know, collect data at a county level. Um, so those are some things, ways that I think that people can, can partner better. Yeah, very helpful. I mean, one of the themes that's coming through is if you're talking about environmental justice, you really have to start from the ground up. Um, it's, it's about community, it's about organizing, it's about listening. And one of the things that's come up with, um, with each of you is it, it's about a, a spirit of curiosity, but also a spirit of humility that we don't know what our life experiences have never had. So it's an, it's an interesting um, um, direction that this has gone. I do want to remind folks at this point that there is a Q&A. Um, and in about, in about 10 minutes or 15 minutes, we're going to open up to questions from people who are um, listening in on the panel. Um, so please be sure to take um, time to look and put in your questions in the Q&A. And also, Shelby, I think we have one more um, poll for the, um, for the group. Is that something we can put up now? Uh, yes, I can activate the next poll. Um, and also for our Facebook listeners, um, I will take questions from the Facebook chat. So um, if you're listening on Facebook, please put it in the chat. I will read them and share those questions with the panelists. Um, so let me open the poll for the next question. Um, yes, here. So I'll launch it and I will read it out loud for our Facebook audience too, so they can participate and respond in the Facebook chat. Um, so do you or your organization name racial equity or environmental justice as a value that guides your work? Um, so if you're in the Zoom room, you can say yes or no. 
And on Facebook, uh, you could also um, share feedback to that uh, inquiry as well. And I'll keep the poll open for another 10 seconds. I am going to end the poll right now. So it looks like many of you do name um, racial equity or environmental justice as part of your work. Um, and Shelby, do we have one more question or is that the last of our poll? Uh, well, we, we do, uh, we, I can share the next one too because there's a final one, but yeah, we can hit them with another question. So um, the next question here, um, I want to learn more about environmental equity and justice in Tennessee. So are you interested in learning more? So let me press the button. And I will leave it open for another five seconds. And for our Facebook folks, uh, please let us know, are you interested in learning more about this subject in your own backyard? Okay, ending the poll. Great. So it looks like most of us are interested in learning more. And I think that that's one of the issues that we've, we've brought up in this, in this panel is that learning more um, and also being curious and uh, humble in our approach to that. Um, so I am gonna switch directions a little bit and talk about organizations. Um, um, you know, we talk about biodiversity in um, the environment as being a kind of a hallmark of a healthy environment, one that's thriving. Um, and yet many of our environmental organizations um, are predominantly white. And so I'm, I'm wondering, um, kind of what, what in the past do you think has led us to the place where um, environmental organizations are predominantly white? And what do you think these organizations need to do as a, a first step um, to um, be more welcoming, being more inclusive, and dismantle um, systemic racism within our own organization? So that's a lot of question. You can approach it from different directions. But it's, it's my philosophy that when you're talking about um, white supremacy and you're talking about um, systemic racism, that it's white people that it's our primarily our job to be about dismantling racism. So I'm going to start with our um, with our white panelists and then move move through our panelists. So Erica, can you give your your thoughts about how how do we address um, um, exclusion or how do we address um, kind of the white supremacy that's dominant in our environmental organizations? Yeah, um, so that's such an important conversation to have and a conversation that, um, you know, I've been glad to, to be a part of in more and more spaces um, in, in different organizations that I'm involved with. Um, I, I will say, you know, the, the major environmental groups, at least, are, were founded by mostly well-off white people who uh, wanted to preserve uh, natural spaces for their own enjoyment. Um, and that legacy has, has continued uh, when we talk about the, the big environmental groups. And um, I, I do think some groups are starting to come around to the fact that um, it's, it's just, it's impractical and it's, um, superficial to have um, to have leadership in these organizations be white, uh, completely whitewashed. Um, but, uh, you know, something that I think, you know, the organizations will, will talk about, we need diversity in our leadership, you know, we need diversity in our membership, but um, may not be willing to make the work of the organization reflect, um, you know, reflect beyond that same sort of whitewashed list of priorities. Um, so, so then the um, desire to have, um, you know, people of color on the board, for instance, it comes across as tokenizing and completely counterproductive. And, um, and those are conversations, you know, in, in my role in some of these spaces I've, I've had with people and I'm happy to continue uh, having them. But until the work of the organizations uh, is truly dedicated to combating racism at all levels, you know, when we have to address our own bias biases, um, you know, I have implicit bias because I've been, I've grown up in a, uh, you know, a predominantly white society, um, you know, so that's something that 
as leaders, as members, we have to work on and look at the effect that, um, you know, from there up, uh, it, it's having on, on our organizations and um, where uh, it, it reflection is required as well on where uh, the request for diversity um, is coming from. Um, so it takes, it takes a long-term commitment and not just a, a desire that, you know, sounds good to people in the moment. And, and um, that's, that's sort of what um, SOCOM has been working on and um, I've been encouraging other groups to, to think about it as well. Yeah, so while I hear you saying it's a long-term commitment also that it starts from the inside out. It starts by looking at a, ourselves individually and our own biases and our own experience um, with racism and then bringing it to the, to the conversation of the organization and truly changing the nature of the organization's work. Um, Lisa, what are your thoughts about what do we do at organizational levels to um, to address the historic um, and the systemic racism? Um, I'll offer two things I was thinking about. Um, one goes back to the, the word that um, was brought up earlier about humility, which is to, to, if your organization is an environmentally focused organization that's historically white, you know, I think Keki, maybe you might be referring to like the, you know, Sierra Club, all these kinds of, of, of groups that see themselves as, as environmental organizations and why aren't people of color part of our organization? Well, guess what? People of color have been working on environmental issues and working on environmental justice issues for a long, long time, whether it's been called that or not and so that's that's one thing i want to offer is this kind of humility that that white people aren't the only people who have been been um working on these issues and so maybe it's not about uh maybe the only way to think about it isn't how do we get get you to join us because even that sometimes can have a co-opting kind of come join our organization so much as here we are here here's you you've been working on on uh, i'll think about denver here as i'm starting to get to know you know denver like many other cities has has neighborhoods where highways have been built right smack in the middle of communities of color um and lower income community and and have just ripped those communities apart and that didn't happen in the wealthy white neighborhood and people have been fighting that as an environmental justice issue for years even if they weren't doing it in the name of an environmental organization. So, so it also goes back to that partnering idea. Look for where the bridges are, you know, between organizations and efforts that are already, already working. And then my second thought was um, to do the work, uh, do the work to, if you are a predominantly white organization, you know, and it, you know, it can't just be the performative work. Um, it, you have to put in the time, um, if you're going to ask black and brown people to help you do the work, then they need to be compensated um, above and beyond, you know, for helping you do the work. If that's even who you're going to consider helping you do the work, that may not be the right, you know, you like, so just, just really do the work um, and put time and effort into questioning, understanding everybody in your organization's um, own racist behaviors whether they want to recognize that or not like that's part of the work is recognizing what you know there's what is it if your organization is trying to be professional what does professional mean professional is often a, a code for for whiteness and so what does that mean um so just really putting in um concrete long term it's not going to happen by reading one book and having a book group about it uh, work to change your own organization. Start, start with yourself. You're looking at your values, your beliefs, your, your, the, the way of thinking, and then, um, and then saying, how do, we, how do we partner? And I also appreciate um, it being, being someone who works in the funding arena is um, that it, when you're going to partner, be sure you've written your partners into your grant applications so that they're compensated for their work and their time that they put into the partnership as well as you. Um, so, um, um, Deetra, we'll move to you. What do you think that that um, environmental organizations should be doing um, right now? Well, that's a big question, and I was when I saw it, I thought about it. Mm, just I'm thinking back to my experiences, right? Uh, being a woman, and then being a person of color in forestry, um, I can tell you the number of meetings that I went, but often. I may be the only woman, definitely the only person of color in the room. Um, I think that organizations need to really just look at the makeup of the leadership, 
look up the makeup of their board of directors and look at what communities they serve and their mission, right? Um, I just think that oftentimes, and, 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 I, and I hate to say it, like, I, I feel like for me, as a woman and person of color, whenever there's an issue around diversity in forestry, it's, it's typically the same, and I can count on my hand, the same women of color that are invited to every meeting, right? And so instead of saying, hey, I'm gonna pick you for this meeting, let's look at issues and ways to increase that participation, right? How do we train students to become, to work for nonprofits, right? I think that's an issue. College students, let them know what a nonprofit organization is. How do you work at one? How do you create budgets? Um, how do you provide these skills and knowledge to the next generation to train them? Um, I think education is the key. Um, another thing is just, in my opinion, is with the youth, is changing that mindset of what the environment is, right? Um, I, particularly among the black community, sometimes, especially when you think about agriculture, they automatically think of farming, right? They don't think about food systems or think about biotechnology or hydrology or study ecosystem services or wildlife biology. Um, they may just honor that, that negative connotation of farming. So how do we change the youth? How do we educate them? I think partnerships are the key, partnering with organizations that have diversity, equity, inclusion goals and seeing, you know, not just saying I want to partner, but have an active partnership um, with them. Um, I must say that of the partnerships that I have um, recently, I have one with Michigan State and then one with Purdue, and then I have Vanderbilt and then Urban Green Lab. Uh, I think, and even with Nashville, these are active partnership that we work and we provide services to each other, um, not just them seeking TSU for that diversity checkbox. Right, yeah, the, the, again, the, the nature of those partnerships have to be mutual and, um, and benefit both. Um, so Stan, you get the last word, and I think uh, Deidre set you up well because she talked about education, she talked about youth, she talked about partnering. Um, what are your thoughts about what environmental organizations can do um, to, a, to be more inclusive, to be, and not just inclusive, but in, indeed organizations that reflect equity? Uh, let me see. I'm not, okay, I'm off. Well, okay. it's a whole bunch of stuff. So uh, I'm going to start with like, uh oh. This is this ain't this ain't racist, but it's it's something. I don't know what it's what it's called, but it, duplication of services, right? Every one of us have heard about this duplication of services that the funders say that we do, and I tell them this problem is so damn big. You're gonna have to you're gonna have to duplicate some services. All these people are not gonna be interested in the same type of. Uh, I mean, the, the same person that'll go to Fisk is the same person that'll go to TSU. Same person that go to the UT ain't the same person they go to Michigan State, right? I mean, there's some, there's some, there's some stuff inside of there that we gonna have to duplicate some of these services. But the first thing I would tell people is just stop being racist. You look at your organization, you you know who in there, you know who is is in the in the pro, in the process. So really, at the end of the day, look at who you give money to. Like I'm a black man in America. But I'm from Jamaica, which is all black men in Jamaica, right? Black women, of course. So we don't really look at it as racism. We look at it as classism, you know? So just think about the people who are inside of these environmental classes. The, you know, I remember the, the, uh, the um, hey, I about to, forgot the club name, Sierra Club, right? I'm actually on the Exxon. Well, they came recruiting me because I'm black. And they asked me, why, why aren't more black people in your organization? Well, man, when the last time y'all been to the hood? Oh, you mean the hood? Yeah, like the hood. <laughs> well, we don't necessarily go, well, how you gonna find more people of color to do this stuff? So it goes back to what Dr. Young was saying. We got the three or four black people that we know. So we just talk about those people. And then we start talking about the equity part, right? We know that in the coronavirus, blacks and elderly are being more uh, susceptible to it. We understand that uh, education, blacks are way behind. We uh, uh, health, 
blacks way behind. Finances, blacks are way behind. So we're talking about equity. We're really going to be having to talk about reparations at some point in this conversation, because if you're talking about equity, that means you're going to have to give that person more help than anybody else. And if we're talking about environmental stuff, here I am in, in Knoxville in the hood trying to run a nine person operation to serve over 1300 people in our community to, to do this. So I'm going to have to team up with the University of Tennessee. I'm going to have to team up with all these people to just get the information out. Right. So when we really get down to it, it's about how do we feed these young people not to do the other stuff? Right. How do we actually get these people involved? Why are these young people going to TSU in the first place? Well, we got to go get a job. Why are these young people going to the University of Tennessee? Because we got to go get a job. But nobody's talking about a job in the sense of nonprofit that you can actually also help the environment, and not just be about this money. We're, we're too much about all of this money. We're not enough about what really matters. And that's what I would consider to be quality. And at some place in there, if we're not really looking at that, we can't build capacity, right? Because if I'm a black man in this city, and if you look at all the funding sources or fund funding that these organizations have done, how many black men, how many black women have gotten the funding in these organizations? Or do we still gonna fund the zoo, which is a great program, I'm not dismissing anything. But the point is, how do we even get to build the capacity to do the work that we really need to get done? And that's my take on it. Thank, thank you for that honest reflection. And, and you know, the funding, the access um, are so important in order to not build something that's equal, but actually equitable. And that e equity is, is different and it does require some um, reparations. So um, let me, we're at the point where we are open to Q&A. And I think Shelby, you've been monitoring the Q&A and I'm wondering if there are some questions um, that participants have for the panel. Yes, um, and I will start going through the questions. We have questions in the Q&A function here, and then I see some activity on the Facebook. Um, and I'll try to distill it a little bit, but it's good people are providing context for the question. So um, the first question, how does the panel think that their work and therefore the success of their work is impi impacted by a lack of clear vision and our strategy that can be more easily digested by the broader, broader public. And then the person goes on to say, um, do you think that if there was more clearly defined strategy, um, how could that help with public engagement? Um, and then they have a comment here, I found it difficult to engage meaningfully, including to understand what the overall scope of the problems are, and also then um, current strategies for tackling the identified problems. So hopefully that is clear enough for the panelists to address. You know, I'm, I might start with um, Lisa, if you'd be willing to take a stab at that, because I think you've already touched a little bit upon on um, how do we name and identify things. I'm happy to. Uh, a couple things that come to mind. Lack of a clear vision and strategy. It's a big problem. Environment, how big is this umbrella of environmental issues? We've given so many different kinds of examples and barely scratched the surface. So um, I think it can feel um, daunting, where to, where to start, where to make a difference. I, uh, I think that you've got to pick something, you know, don't, don't be daunted by how am I going to make a difference or my organization isn't going to make a difference in climate change and solve the climate crisis. Um, so that's one thought is, is pick, pick something that is concrete. Um, if you're not familiar with, um, well, this is specific to drawing down emissions, but Project Drawdown, um, look that up because that also shows, you know, it's this compendium of, of different ways to draw down emissions, some of which um, uh, are focusing on uh, education of women and girls and empowerment of women and girls. And if you work on that, you are actually contributing to solving climate change. Um, so there's so many different pieces. I'm not sure if there ever, ever will be one single, you know, one, one strategy for how do we, how do we tackle this, this big problem? Because um, also as we, as we all probably on this call know, as we are, you know, need much more urgency and action around emissions reduction, we're already committed no matter what 
uh, to a certain amount of climate change and the impacts that are going to happen. Um, so, so I know I had another um, something else to offer about lack of clear vision. If it comes back to me, I'll hop back in. But uh, but I wanted to start with that example of Project Drawdown and and just uh, choose one part of it to work on. Other other panelists have ideas about that. Well, I mean, look at the look at the fires in California, right? We thought it was just in California, but if you look at the map, it's actually, it's like all over the West, right? Including close to Denver somewhere, you know? So these, these things are huge problems. I would suggest that, you know, whatever your passion is, uh, you take that part of it. You know, we work on four areas here. Of course, we talk about weatherization. We talk about recycling, we talk about solar installation, and we also talk about uh, community gardening. So we, shoot, we tell our students that this thing is huge, whatever floats your boat in a sense, because we want you to get a job. We want you to turn that job into a career that is good for the planet, good for your, your economic structure, and is good for your community. So we want to make sure that that's what we focus on. Now, we're not selling you that there's not, again, like Lisa said, many things to focus on. But we just chose to focus on those four things. So I think that you uh, find your niche. That's interesting. Can I, can I hop back in? Because I remembered and I jotted down my additional points related to it. So, so one is, you know, policy change. So I think one thing that's been a theme today is how much these environmental justice and climate justice issues intersect with health and finances and mental health. They also connect to... Um, healthcare, medication use in ways we didn't talk about yet, but the impact of heat waves is you're more susceptible if you're taking certain medications. And so po real policy change often takes these, these alliances and they aren't necessarily permanent alliances. Sometimes they're temporary alliances. And so think about that way too, like w uh, on, on certain issues, where, where might you partner? Maybe you're actually on this call, but you're from a health focused organization. Great. We want to partner with you, you know, to make this happen. And the other thing I like to bring up in response to something like this is I always like to plug Catherine Hayhoe and her work. She's a climate, um, climate scientist from Texas. Um, she talks a lot about the importance of talking about climate change. Just talk about it with people. And, and another theme on this call is maybe you're not always talking about it as climate change, especially if you're talking with somebody for whom that is some kind of um, you're not going to be able to have a, you know, just a conversation. <laughs> yeah, like what Stan's doing, right? So, but, but just the importance of having these everyday conversations about it is part of, of generating more public support, public awareness, um, seeing how it connects to you and your life, even if you're not, uh, you don't identify as some kind of, you know, advocate who's pa super passionate about climate issues. So talk about it. It's, I, it is interesting how we, um, the language we use is so important um, to being able to connect with people. And it's another reason why we need people with di different life experiences within our organizations to be able to cut across and make those connections that are so essential to the movement. Um, um, Shelby, do we have other questions from participants? Uh, yes, and actually I think the Facebook, a question from Facebook is a good uh, segue um, because this person asks from Facebook, from an environmental justice perspective, what would be the top, and they asked for three, but you know, you know, top um, policies and practices you each believe to be most needed and effective to first implement in communities. So perhaps from a priority perspective. Interesting, that's a good question. I think we're actually gonna go around the horn on that one. And the question was the top three policy priorities for, adjust, for addressing environmental justice. Is that right, Shelby? Is that how they um, Well, they said from an environmental justice perspective, but what would need to be done in communities? And so, yeah, whatever. Top three policy priorities. So why don't I start, um, Dr. Young, with you? Top three priority, pro <laughs> that, that's a good one. You're, you're on mute. Yeah, yeah, that is a, uh, wow. <laughs> it, it is, it is, I'm sitting here trying to think. Um, I, I would think maybe permitting, um, in my opinion, um, and, I know I, where I live, there was an issue with the oil plant being removed 
um, to Bordeaux, not Bordeaux, um, what do you call this area? Near UPS um, over here off of Briley. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen permitting. Oh, that's, that's, that's a hard question. <laughs> um, I, I'm in, like, I, and, I, and I'm thinking about like, for me having an urban forestry background, right? Um, I'm thinking about tree removal and urbanization and, and new construction and um, just trying to think like, you know, what are things that we can do and what policies are in place um, in, 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 in surrounding that? That's, that's what I think for me, because that's the, the area that I'm really interested in, because I know the value of trees and I know tree equity. And so for me, I think policies surrounding that Mm, that's right. a, you're think. talking like an expert in forestry so thank you for that um erica what do you what about you what do you think should be those priorities so um i don't i don't want to speak for myself personally um because i don't i don't know that what i find most important is necessarily um, you know, that's, that's not really what's driving um, the work that we're doing, but um, something that comes up again and again um, with the SACA membership is um, this idea of a just transition. So when we talk about um, clean energy in particular, um, to make sure that we're not talking about going into, into communities that have, uh, you know, historically been um, resource extraction heavy communities and um, immediately shutting down all the mines and uh, closing, you know, closing all of those systems down and putting up um, some wind farms that, you know, will employ a couple of people, but um, it, it's about making sure that we don't sacrifice the people who are affected by these problems in the pursuit of solving the problems. Um, you know, we, we get these ideas of, uh, of a better future and, you know, a vision of, of all of our energy coming from solar and wind, and, and that's wonderful, but just making sure that um, in the meantime, because we're, we're not there yet, um, making sure that the steps taken um, to get to that point, um, which, you know, which ensures uh, greater, you know, equity for everybody, um, that we're not doing more harm than good. Um, so it's something to, to continually be aware of and to um, reflect in um, all of our policies. And, and right. we hear that again and again from, from members. I've never heard the, the term just transitions, but it does really ring true that if people have been historically marginalized, then we don't want to kick them to the side once again when we're trying to solve a problem that affects everyone. So um, um, Lisa, what are your thoughts? Some policy well, priorities. Yeah, I will offer um, you know, definitely a policy priority around clean energy continuing our shift, you know, and, and more rapidly to clean energy. And with the caveats that, that Erica has made about it being a just transition to clean energy. And also with the sub policies, you know, I can, I can be an academic, there's like one and then one A and one B. So one B being the caveats around um, that, that as the clean energy sector creates new jobs, that those be good jobs with equitable access, with good benefits, um, but the equitable access to those jobs is key. Um, another policy I'd like to see, um, it, it's not so much policy to pass so much as a way to do policy is to do a lot more local level downscaled adaptation planning with really meaningful engagement, which has been a theme on this call. And then of course, not planning just for planning sake, but then actual next steps, concrete actions, implementation um, of local adaptation plans. Um, and then the third one I'll offer is, is again, showcasing how these issues, um, helping people cope with environmental injustice and, and cope, for some people, it's actually survive. Helping, you know, people who are disproportionately impacted survive heat waves and floods. Um, or, and if they do survive then to, to bounce back and recover requires more access to things like health insurance. 
more access to financial resources, to financial, um, to, to helping folks restore credit if they, if they have been subject to um, predatory lending um, practices, and um, which is another issue very much connected to racism, which becomes an environmental racism issue in my book. If because you have um, experienced predatory lending, then your, your finances have taken a hit and therefore you have less, um, you know, Find money say if any money saved to then cope when disaster disaster hits um, and even low level disaster you know so um, so connecting the dots another expression from earlier connecting the dots between these environmental issues and other injustices health insurance injustices financial resource injustices right so um, you've kind of connected the environmental justice with all the other justice movements that we we're all interconnected. Um, and Stan, you have the final word on that on that question. I thought she set it up you up really well talking about um, ac access to good equitable employment with benefits and good pay. Um, those are certainly things that are important. But do you have any other thoughts about um, policy priorities um, in environmental justice? Well, that's that's the biggest thing to me is a just transition from that fossil fuel coal fire ash mindset to solar wind weatherization renewables, right? So there needs to be a, a policy that we're talking about. If we're looking at this, is coal gonna be our way of getting out of this climate change process? Is, is oil gonna be that, right? And we're saying no, the scientists are saying no. So if there needs to be a switch, we need to stop talking about it in the aspect because the next part of that is funding, right? You'll fund me go research a coal mine. You'll fund me to go research a oil field, right? You'll even pay for some of that this extraction from the oil field, but you won't pay for the research on solar? Like that should tell us right there our, where our politicians have been really focused on, like who's giving the money for running their campaigns? So it has to be a policy to make sure that that happens. So the second part is funding those policies right? People, we all talk about how these policies can get put in place, but they don't never get funded. So how do you get, how do you get the money? I can remember whatever act of whatever act of, <laughs> that George Bush put in place, and we still got money sitting someplace that we can't even touch, and we don't know what it's about, and da, da, da. Our state of Tennessee has like 730 something th million dollars of money that they're supposed to give to poor people. I don't know the whole detail about that. Maybe our Sockham folks know a little bit more about that than I do. But they won't even fund the projects to help poor people. And, and the last part of this is really start tying CO2 reductions, 2050 plans, and all those plans to equity and health, right? Because if you get a healthier planet, you should get a healthier human being. We're not really focusing on the healthier human being and the quality of life that we're having, right? We just had a we had the biggest ash spill in the country, in uh, in in Kingston, Tennessee. They had people go clean the ash spill up, and told those people, "We're going to give you great paying jobs. It's going to be wonderful." Matter of fact, you only have to wear no hazmat suits. Just just go clean it up, right? Now we're finding out that forty of I think forty one of them, the last count I had, have died. Like we are literally killing people and we're not even environmental stuff. I mean, it's, sorry. <laughs> it's like, it, it's, it's almost craziness when you start thinking about how come we're not thinking about our health and the environment at the same time and being able to make that into a policy that we're gonna have carbon reduction by this much by 50-50, but we should also have a health impact survey to do that as well. So mine would be funding. Uh, the transition, a just transition from coal to uh, fossil fuel and the, and the solar weatherization, renewable, you know, all those kind of things, and tying those carbon emission goals that we all have into health and equity. Right. Well, um, I think what, what this panel has done is really set it up that a week from now, we're going to come back and have a participatory conversation. And are there are more questions in the Q&A than we can get to, um, but there is next week to be able to unfold some of these issues I also appreciate several things about this panel. One is that your passion and your commitment to the issue, your ability to connect the dots, your ability to see, see that, um, that it's a tapestry 
it's not just, uh, it's not trees, it's not just water, it's not just land, but it's how are people interacting with that land and that what, what serves the land and the water serves the people that are there. So how do we draw those connections between community, environmental justice, um, and, and environmental freedom um, and to, to thrive um, both in, in our natural order, but also when, when people are interacting. So I'm really gonna invite y'all back to next, next week um, to interact more and to talk more um, and to bring your questions to each other. Um, I think though that, that Shelby and that Jeff have some closing, um, closing remarks and in order for us to be off, um, and to give people their time, um, then we're, we're gonna transition to our closing. I'll also say thank you for sticking with us because when you look at the participants, we didn't lose participants during this, which often happens in an hour and a half Zoom call. I think that speaks to the Environmental Council putting together a great panel and our panel bringing great information and passion to the conversation. So Jeff and Shelby, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Kaki. And I have some housekeeping stuff and then Jeff will close us out. And we did have some additional questions that we didn't get to, but I might uh, take a look at those and, and, and follow up with people offline so I can see if I can save that um, because I'm glad people are interested. Um, but as Kathy said, this is just the beginning. We're in part, we're ending part one, but we have part two. Um, and for folks that are familiar with the council, we usually have an in-person policy and practice in August, uh, but due to COVID, we're here in this virtual form. So we had um, you know, the opportunity to do something new, but we're still going to have the interactive session. So not all in one day, but we separated across two days. So um, what you will see from me is a follow-up email and it will um, give you um, a reading or suggested reading that you can look at between now and next week about environmental justice. And it will also give you details on how to log in for next time because I have a logistical change I need to do. So for folks that did register, um, you won't fall for next week don't follow the um, instructions from that original email. I'll cancel that. So from the follow-up email that you'll see from me soon, we'll have the proper login. And if you did not register uh, for the policy and practice part two where it's interactive, you can still join. So you can um, email me um, and I can have that you know, shared and you can still join us. So just follow the directions in that email so you can join us next time. Um, so I'm trying to think, I guess I can, yeah. Jeff, you can close us out uh, now. Uh, but I should say thank you to everyone for coming. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to Kaki. Um, yeah, we, I had a great time and I uh, hope our audience had a great time too. Okay, so Jeff. Hey, um, my name is Jeffrey Berry. Thank you, Shelby. Um, and what I want to do to close us out is just to first of all, thank, encourage, and remind. And uh, I thank the panelists because I gained some nuggets of inspiration from each of you and everything you had to say today and your life experience in these, in these important fields and of work that you do. Uh, to thank our moderator, Kaki, and our organizers, Shelby, Emily, and Erica, and Brandy behind the scenes, our staff, um, and all the, all the um, attendees and guests today. And for those of you who do have devoted your lives to this work, um, it's incredibly, immensely inspiring to me, and it's important work, and so I admire you for taking your life path in this direction and bringing it here with us today and, and where you go from here. Um, so thank you. And I want to encourage you to think about how you can improve equity in your own thinking and in your day-to-day -day lives, which we're all talking about today. How can you take something you learned today and incorporate it or look at things with a fresh perspective or call somebody to make a connection that you wouldn't otherwise, that you, you had maybe thought about, but now you know you have to do it and, and start to build relationships beyond the normal circle of people you work with. And so I'm gonna to commit to doing that um, in, in bringing equity more into the work I do and into my family life with my daughters as well and my friends in my neighborhood. Um, and to remind you to show up next week because we're gonna roll up our sleeves a little bit and take some of the lessons from today. Thanks to Shelby's guidance and she will in, remind us what it is we need to do to be ready for next Friday uh, and also to make it an effective gathering to, to get into the nuts and bolts and make it a little bit more practical, take the information we have and put it to good use in making the world a better place for everybody. So thank you. With that, we can adjourn this meeting. I'll see you all next week. <laughs>